Hi, everyone. It's Helen from SMB Deal Hunter. Today, we have Eric Pasifici with us, an M&A lawyer who specializes in SMB transactions. Very excited to learn from Eric today. Eric, it's great to have you. Just uh, for the audience's background, those of you that don't know me, my name is Eric Pasifici. I go by SMB attorney on X. Um, we built a law firm called SMB Law Group. We started two years ago. We're all former big law trained, top 14 educated attorneys. I was at Kirkland and Ellis. My partner, uh, my main partner, Kevin Henderson, started his career at Kervath. And then we've got a third partner named Sam Rizzotti, who uh, started his career at Foley and Lardner as UVA educated attorney. But he he left the law to buy businesses and started a private equity fund called Pursuant Capitals, had multiple exits and has invested kind of um, pretty heavily in the space and runs a boot camp and things like that. So we wanted to build a law firm specifically for Main Street buyers uh, and sellers that really does things differently. We've got flat fee billing, we've got busted deal fee protection, and you know we're, we're really set up to support buyers kind of throughout the whole life cycle, right? All the way through kind of the operating process. We, we offer a bunch of post-closing services that are a part of our deal package, including cleanup of the target company, fractional general counsel support for a, a period of time post-closing. So you've got somebody to call a premium network of, of really high quality SMB providers that have exclusive offers. We offer a quarterly um, operations boot camp where we kind of give people a, a rundown of, you know, what to do post-closing, who to call if you've got you know, finance, you know, uh, working capital issues, you need a fractional CFO, you know, we want to get you lined up with the right person. So we're trying to build a mousetrap that really puts a business buyer, a small business buyer in a strong position. Um, last year was our first year of operations, first full year, and we did about 950 million in total deal volume. Um, five to 600 million of that was um, SBA 7A transactions. Um, so we've seen a ton across all the best lenders and we're licensed in a lot of the major jurisdictions, New York, Florida, Texas, California, Colorado, Michigan, Minnesota, Georgia, North Carolina, the places that most small business buyers want to be. We now have licensure and are able to work in other states as well, um, subject to their ethics rules. So I feel like we've built a pretty cool mousetrap and now we're just trying to kind of see where we can take it. Very exciting. Congratulations yeah. on, on all the, all the success in the past year. It's pretty incredible, Eric. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I guess couple, I guess first question for me is probably just, is just your background. How did you personally get into this and what were you doing prior to s and Law Group? Yeah, well, I feel like everybody else in the space, I just fell in love with the investment opportunity, right? I was working in big law and having lunch with a buddy and he's like, you know, and I was telling about what I wanted to do with my life and, you know, kind of moaning and groaning about life in big law. And he was like, Eric, you should think about buying a business. Like that sounds like maybe a good fit for you. He was getting ready. He was at Goldman and Sachs. He was getting ready to move to Austin to run a search fund. So he was like, kind of had just drank the Kool-Aid. He's like, this would be good for you. And I was like, buy a business, Frank. His name is Frank Rivera. Um, and I was a, a big law m and attorney. I was like, buy a business. Like, what the hell are you talking about? Like nobody buys businesses, Frank, you know? Um, he's like, no, you should read this book. The HBR guide to buying a business, you know, the buy them build, um, this is back in 2017. So, you know, over the course of the next couple of days, read, you know, like much like other people read the books cover to cover, fell in love, you know, read everything I could get my hands on about small business MA. And then frankly, just sat on it for a couple of years, was working in big law. Salaries are so high. You know, I've got little kids. Um, and I'm like, yeah, starting a starting my own law firm. Like, I don't want to put my name on billboards and park benches and, you know, have a physical office where I got to put crappy furniture in there. Like that sounds terrible. So you know, I'll just ride it out and then maybe I'll buy a business myself and, and uh, you know, move into the investment space. And um, COVID hits, you know, was bored and had been following the conversation on social media for a long time in the business buying space, kind of the SMB Twitter world of old um, and decided to make an anonymous handle SMB attorney and start tweeting about legal M&A because I noticed there was kind of a gap in the conversation about how do you actually buy a business from a legal perspective um, and it took off really fast and it's funny in hindsight and these numbers are probably laughable to a marketing genius like you Helen but I had like 15,000 Twitter followers in the first six months and I was like oh my god like this is so many followers and it really wasn't a ton quantitatively but qualitatively I mean it was rock solid small business people and so I started getting DM after DM of saying, hey, will you help me with this two, four, six, eight, ten million dollar deal? And having to say over and over again, like I work at Kirkland and Ellis, I bill at fifteen hundred dollars an hour, can't do it. But let me find you somebody. And then quickly after a matter of months realizing, like, holy crap, like they don't exist. Like you either have terrible small business attorneys that don't know MA at all. We see them a ton on the sell side, 
or you've got, you know, true mid market MA attorneys, but like you take up a $4 million deal and you're the, they've got 12 things on their to-do list and you're the 12th most important, you know? So it's a big problem. So we're like, okay, let's build something specifically for the, the space, two to $15 million MA, see what happens. You know, I was in the shower like a week before launch laughing audibly going like, I'm leaving Kirkland and Ellis, like arguably the best law firm on the planet where I make, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, the better part of a million bucks a year to start a firm off of Twitter, largely. Like this will either be the dumbest thing anybody's ever done or like whatever. And it depends on what day you ask me. Um, some some days it's the latter, but sometimes most days it's pretty great. So that's, that's awesome. Were you, were you in, um, were you in Florida then too? Or did you move your family when you started SMB Law Group? What did that look like? Yeah. So I actually, I was working remotely for Kirkland and Ellis during the pandemic. And so this is how big law firms work is actually quite funny. I moved from Boulder, Colorado to Florida. Didn't even tell them, right. Cause I was working out of the Texas offices and the, one of the partners I was working for was like, man, I saw you guys just got a snowstorm, yada, yada. And I was like, oh, well actually Julian, you know, I'm in Florida now. I live in Florida. And he was like, great. You know, that's awesome. Oh, we love Florida. You know, we're opening a Miami office. We love Florida, you know? Uh, so when you work for those big firms, especially in like that environment, it's like, what are you billing? You're a number on a spreadsheet. You know, we don't even give a shit where you're located. Um, so yeah, so I was here when I started. That's awesome. And how many yeah. people did you guys start with? Was it just you, um, doing all the, doing all the work or what did that look like? Yeah. So at the beginning it was just me and Kevin doing the work. Um, and then our third partner, Sam, more of a biz dev, more of, you know, we wanted some, because, you know, we had done mid-market, large cap M&A, but you bring that down to Main Street, and it's very different, right? Like these sellers and SBA terms and all that, it's more pseudo business advising really than it even is legal oftentimes. So we're like, man, we got to have somebody that knows Main Street on our team. So we bring Sam in at the beginning, which was a great fit, um, but it was Kevin and I. And we had to decide early on, we're like, what are we doing here? You know, are we building a boutique firm where you and I do a couple deals at a time from our kitchen table? And, and, you know, and go golfing at two o'clock or are we building a real, you know, business? And, you know, one thing I knew for sure from the very start, Helen, is I did not want to build a traditional law firm, right? Traditional law firms, you're, you're a sophisticated business person. They're terrible businesses. You know, it's an inch wide or sorry, a mile wide, an inch deep with equity. Um, they're glorified jobs. Even at the highest level, you stop working, you stop making income, right? And I'm like, I'm not going to kill myself to build a 50, 100 person organization in the law, like I've seen many people do to, you know, get out earned by a partner who comes in the next week and is just producing more than me. Like you do that in HVAC or, you know, any of our clients and generally profitable businesses, and you've got a, you know, 10, 20, 50, hundred million dollar enterprise, you do it in the law, you, you've got nothing because you, you can't even sell it for legal ethics purposes. So we're like, we're doing this, we're building a real business, you know, something that's scalable, something that's repeatable, something that does not have key man risk, something that does not have, you know, um, all the, the issues with traditional law firms. So far, that's, that's proven to be difficult, right? I mean, a lot of this stuff, 100 year old, you know, second oldest profession, according to some folks, you know, a lot of the reason things are done certain ways are done that way for a good reason. You find that after a couple of years of trying to go a different direction. Um, but we still found ways to kind of do it a little bit differently um, than everybody else. And it's been a fun experience. No, I mean, you guys, the flat fee structure is super interesting. I mean, can you tell me how you guys, you know, came to that conclusion or you know, what made you decide to, I guess, structure your offer differently? Yeah, we had the benefit of a giant community behind us, both through social media and through the entrepreneurship through acquisition communities at all the amazing schools around the country. And when we decided to launch, probably the best thing that we've done in our business and still strive to do all the time is we asked our clients what they wanted from us, right? We just went before we started the firm, we, we turned around, we said, tell us what you want. And the vast majority of people said, we hate the billable hour, like 90 plus percent of respondents. And I'm talking thousands of respondents. were not just like, Hey, we don't like the billable hour. They were like, we hate the billable hour. Like it's the worst, right. And for incentive purposes. And, you know, you take your lawyer to lunch, he sends you a bill afterwards for the 45 minutes or whatever, uh, relational and communication is terrible. Um, so what well, there was a small subset of people that were like, Hey, I've got a great lawyer. He's efficient. We've worked together a long time or she's efficient. We've worked together a long time. So, you know, it's fine, but everybody else hated. So we're like, you know, let's do a, 
let's do a fixed fee model. Uh, and then the other biggest issue is that our clients are rightfully concerned about busted deal fees. So let's give them protection against busted deal fees and make sure that they're set up in a position that we're taking risk alongside them. Not too much risk, right? Because you don't want your lawyer conflicted. Um, but enough risk that you feel good about the fact that if the deal blows up, that you're not going to eat the full cost and that there's some partnership with your attorney. Um, and so far, it's resonated extremely well with folks. And we're trying to find ways to do it in other disciplines as well. It's it's hard in litigation and areas like that where the scope of work is going to be very unknown. But I think people appreciate the fact that like any other service that you sell, that we're willing to actually take some risk and try to be efficient because largely they want us to be efficient. They don't want us to negotiate till the cows come home also. Yeah. So it works out both ways. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. Sounds like there's a lot of alignment, which is awesome. Um, yeah. I know, I know we've wasted a, a ton of money on deals on broken deal fees. So um, yeah, that's it's a real great. risk, especially yeah. if you're a first time buyer and you've got, you know, a, a certain set of capital set aside, it's your, it's your whole, if, if it doesn't work out, you're going back to work. Um, that's a real risk. Yeah, you mentioned, you know, you've done what 950 million in total deal volume first full year, five to 600 million in SBA transactions. Any sort of main buckets of, you know, types of industries or deals that you guys have focused on the first year or just deals you've seen? Yeah. So the vast majority of buyers are what I've, I call blue chip ETA, right? They are sophisticated people that are, you know, have experience. They're running a good process. They're using high quality, quality of earnings providers. They're using good lawyers um, and they're looking for good businesses, right? They're not looking at restaurants. They're not looking at, you know, bad businesses like you do see in some traditional kind of biz buy sell, like classic business buying. Um, and largely they are looking for your classic HPR guide to buying a small business enduringly profitable businesses, which is in a whole wide variety of stuff. Right. And I learn on a daily basis about a new type of business that I didn't know existed. Um, like the other day learning about horizontal drilling, I thought it meant fracking, right. Horizontal, but it's not, it doesn't mean fracking. It's something completely different. Um, and so they're they're universally spread ac across you know, HVAC, commercial cleaning, roofing, uh, tree trimming, and then just everything under the sun kind of classic Main Street businesses, which is really cool. Um, kind of changes the way you you look at the world as you're driving around the neighborhood and you see plumbing trucks and you know and the like. Yeah, no, I I feel like being in the space now for a little bit, it's it's cool all the niche businesses that you would never start. Uh, or you would never have the idea to start that are yeah. just for sale or just exist. So we do cool. see a lot of great like tech businesses though, two SaaS businesses. We've got a great partnership with um, Andrew Gazdecki at acquire.com as we see some great tech businesses come out of that. Businesses that I'm starting to fall in love with personally are the ones that have the recurring revenue obvious for obvious reasons. Um, a lot of, a lot of great businesses that people are buying, you know, $4 million purchase price. And it's got, you know, 1.4 million in annual recurring bottom line. You're like, wow. like, yeah, like I'll take a piece of that, you know? So from your perspective, what's, what's like the biggest challenge for searchers? Is it during the, is it finding the actual deal? Is it the negotiating phase? I mean, you're probably working with people sort of through the entire life cycle, but I'm, I'm curious where, where you're seeing, um, the biggest challenge be? Well, the biggest challenge for them is, is operating the business, right? Running a business is hard. You know, it's a punch in the face every day for like one, you know, Yahoo moment every two weeks and then back to getting punched in the face. Right. So, and business buyers are no different. I do think it's a better way to get into entrepreneurship than starting from scratch. Right. Cause you've got a brand and product market fit and hopefully some, you know, established systems and processes, but it's still really hard, right? And so post-closing, we see a lot of challenges with sellers that compete, sellers that try to take things, uh, you know, SEO results that plummet, um, you know, everything under the sun, you know, keep people who take off, keep people who compete, um, you know, so you get into the business, you're going to run into stuff, right? You go down our list of closed transactions and there's very few where I can't point to like one thing that did happen. Now it's almost always fine, right? Um, they get through these issues. You know, we had a client who's buying a business and the key man was so key that he literally had the business tattooed on his body. Right. So in the deal process, they're like, listen, if this guy's not going to be, you know, if he's not sticking around post-closing, like we can't buy this business. So they go and they meet with him. It's this whole big deal. And he agrees to stay on. They think they've got alignment. 
three months after the closing, you know, they get into a blow up fight and he takes off. Wow. And and then you check in with them three months after that. And they're like, yeah, it's everything's fine, Eric. Like he was replaceable just like everybody else. And so they were able to get through it, but operating a business is hard, right? The rest of it, the deal process is not easy, right? The nuts and bolts of it, Helen, like, what are you trying to do? What are you trying to buy? How does an LOI work? How does the deal process work? The negotiation it's not rocket science. It's a lot of sales, right? You're selling yourself to the broker. Then you're selling yourself to the seller. Then you're selling for three months after that. You're selling yourself to the lender. The QE comes in light. You've got to sell that. Um, and so that's a little bit of a tricky process. But if you're a smart, sophisticated, confident, you know, person who's been successful in your life, you'll get, you'll get through that part. Yeah, no, I, I think that's, that's a great answer. Um, a lot of people think that it ends when you've bought the business, but really that's when it, it all begins. So that's when it begins. Yeah. That's why, I mean, that's why these businesses, you know, why does it's, it's a really sexy proposition, right? You go buy a million dollars in earnings for two and a half to four times, you know, so you've got 2.5 to $4 million in purchase price that you've got to pay back. You pay it back over the course of five to 10 years. And then you've got a, you know, cash flowing million dollar asset that you can adjust prices on and, you know, build off of and, you know, structure a holding company and whatever your life's going to be great. Well, and that's true. Right. And I think that that's why it's such a, you know, exciting opportunity, but between the lines, there's a lot of really hard work, a lot of risk, you know, especially comparatively a lot of people coming over from real estate, Helen, that have been real estate investors for a long time. And now they're like, real estate's going nowhere. I've got to do something. Let's go do SMB. And you've got to educate them on like, you know, you bought real estate, and you did nothing, you know, maybe you added some sweat equity, but largely that asset was never just going to go to zero. It was never going to go to zero, right? Yeah. Like this asset you're buying in SMB could go to zero. Like it could stop working at all and you could lose all your money. So it's reason why they trade for two and a half to four times instead of 20 times, like in real estate. Yeah, no, completely fair. And you've done so many SBA deals. You know, what's your perspective on, on the SBA loan uh, in general? My philosophy on SBA loans is that it's a fantastic product, right? It's a really incredible tool that the federal government has given us to create liquidity on Main Street. I mean, the absence of these, these, these tools, you'd see like what you see in Canada, businesses would still be sold, but they'd be sold for seller financing, large portions of seller financing, which would not be as lucrative. You spend your life kind of building a Main Street business, and then your retirement is that nest egg. That, that cash portion, it's really not going to be there. So it's a great wealth creation device for small business operators. Um, and it's a great tool for buyers, everything except for the personal guarantee. The personal guarantee, obviously, there's a lot of risk associated with personally guaranteeing debt, um, but it's covenant light, high leverage debt, which means your returns can be amazing. And um, it's great. Getting through the process, even with the very best lenders, is like getting a mortgage from the Department of Motor Vehicles. It is a gigantic pain in the ass. Even the best, and there's probably about five of them that I think do the, the best and most 7A acquisition financing. And obviously you look at the league tables or the deal tables, there's a lot of them that do it. It gets weighed down pretty heavily by working capital, but um, First Internet Bank, Byline, um, Live Oak, First Bank of the Lake, you know, they do a really good job and many others do a really good job at 7A lending. Um, but even with them, it's a challenge, right? So um, you want to brace yourself for that process. You want to work with advisors. And obviously this is like asking a barber if you need a haircut, but you want to work with advisors that know that process because you can get 60 to 90 days into the deal process and then have the SBA lender attorneys come in and blow your deal up, you know, and ask for things that, you know, even like a sophisticated mid-market attorney is not going to be aware of. Um, so it's, it's a great product, but, you know, be careful when utilizing high leverage personally guaranteed debt. Yeah, for sure. Totally yeah. fair. I'm well, and also I'll, I'll, I'll add one thing on that too, Helen, go to a high quality BDO, right? There are a few business development officers at the best banks that have done, you know, the most, they see 10,000 deals in their lifetime and they'll tell you if it's a good business, right? If you go to 10 great BDOs and they all say no to your transaction, you maybe shouldn't be doing it. Right. You can get an SBA 7A deal through. Like you can find a broker. If you want to, you can get a deal through even with 50 plus percent customer concentration, which is insane. You wouldn't do that deal, right? Um, you can get it through an SBA lender, but the question becomes, do you want to get it through, right? So 
be prudent in not getting it through at all costs, if that makes sense. No, that's completely, completely fair and reasonable. I'm curious what else you've seen sort of hold deals up, um, especially SMB deals. You know, you've, you mentioned, you know, a lot of lawyers working on more middle market deals, but specifically on the SMB side, you know, what have you seen um, hold deals up or slow things down? Yeah, the things that slow things deals down almost every time is one, the QE process, right? Um, you've got to get the seller to provide you with the, quite a bit of financial data on the company. And particularly if they're not working with a broker, and I'm going to go off quickly on a tangent about um, off-market deals. Off-market deals, great opportunity. You can get a better purchase price, maybe get an asset um, at a better value, but much higher risk of fallout. And when you tr start doing things like quality of earnings with an off-market deal, um, there's a lot of risk that there's going to be problems in getting the seller to cooperate and then getting through issues as they arrive with ar arise with the seller. So caution with off market deals. Um, a good broker is an underestimated, you know, tool in a transaction, a good one, right? There's a lot of crappy ones. There's a lot of annoying ones. And I do sympathize with them, right? Cause they deal with a ton of buyers and some are serious and some are not. So they can be a little grouchy and a little bit you know, interested in gatekeeping, but if you get through with a good one, like a Clint Fiore, a Jackie Hirsch, or one of these people that are well-regarded around the country, um, it's going to be a great asset in your transaction. So leverage the broker, but I almost always see a holdup in the QE and the delivery of the documentation to determine, you know, is the proof of cash and is the, you know, is the business actually making as much money as it says it is. And then, um, you know, separately are the ad backs value valid. At the end of that, there's almost always a renegotiation, right? 60 to 70 to 80% of the time, you're finding out that 800K of SDE or EBITDA is actually 650, right? Um, and you got to go back and you got to renegotiate that. And that takes time for them to get warmed up to. Then you get through that and hopefully you haven't held your lawyer back too much. I do say, listen, let's not start legal right away because you want to make sure that you've looked under the hood first, but you also don't want to catch us flat footed too far into the transaction. Cause now we got to go negotiate documents opposite of their lawyers. Sellers counsel oftentimes very unsophisticated folks that, you know, don't know M&A at all or are used to buyers not knowing M&A at all. So they try to cram through really egregious terms. So there's a, a negotiation process there. Then you got to work with landlords, right? Landlords is almost always a hang up. They don't care. Right. They're, they're not interested in your timeline. They don't care if your deal blows up. They don't. So you want to start having conversations with them early because you got to get them to sign subordination documentation with the SBA as well, which oftentimes they'll they'll be upset about. Um, and then the closing process, right? Then you're working with the bank's closing team. And even if you've got an amazing BDO, you know, one of the best business development officers in the country, then you got to work with their very ministerial closing team. And they're not going to take you seriously, Helen. Um until you're at the three yard line, purchase agreements are signed. You've given them everything that they need. Then they'll go, okay, yeah, we can talk about setting a closing date. Up until that point, you'll be going, Hey, can we close on nine 30? Can we, and they'll be going, yeah, yeah, Helen, for sure. Um, lying right to your face the whole time um, until you get to the very end and they'll get serious. So it's a, it's a process. You want to be very proactive and very aggressive in the process or you could lose a deal because of fatigue because sellers oftentimes they'll get to the end and they'll go, I'm exhausted, Helen. Like you're never going to actually close in this deal. Like you don't really know what you're doing. They've got limited visibility to the bank too. They're like, there's no way this bank's going to fund. Um, and that's when deals die. Yeah. I'm curious what percent of deals you work on um, since you have such a large sample size, you know, have died um, post LOI. Yeah. So I think- And then, and then post, and then maybe post QB. Pete, post question. QE. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Two very important stages. I think if you get through QE and you get through the renegotiation on QE, you've got like about an 80% chance of closing. Um, prior to that, probably 50, 50, but deals close like deals do most, the vast majority of the time, I think they do close. Um, especially good deals, especially broker deals. Um, it deals without issues. I mean, there are deals that should not close. Right. And those are largely the ones that you see that don't close. It's very rare. We had one, a few weeks ago where one of the sellers owned a 2% equity stake in the business. And we were asking him to take a, you know, five-year non-compete. And he's like, I own 2% of this business. I'm in Montana, you know, and if I can't compete, then what am I going to do? Go greet at Walmart. I mean, um, so if you're not going to keep me on and if I can't be in this business for 
for at least, you know, or if I'm out of this business for at least three years, like I don't think I can do it. And it blew, it blew up at the end that way, but it's very rare that we just have a seller that goes, you know, I don't feel like doing this anymore. Yeah. I changed my mind. Yeah. No, that, that's reasonable. And I think a lot of people always ask, you know, when should someone actually bring legal counsel into this whole process? When do people usually come to you and when should they come to you? Maybe two different questions. Yeah. Yeah. I know for sure. That, this, this is the, probably the number one question that I get, which is when should we hire you? The answer is you should have us involved at the LOI stage, right? We want to make sure that there is anything missing, egregious, not SBA eligible, you know, just wrong in the LOI. Doesn't mean you should be spending a ton of money on legal, right? We have a very limited scope representation just for the LOI stage to make sure that people get the, the advice that they need without the overwhelming expense that could be a threat to the trend, you know, because you could, you could submit five, 10 LOIs before you ultimately, you know, find a business that you want to proceed with. Um, so we'd like to be involved there. After that, I really think it's important that you do some baseline financial diligence, you know, look at the tax returns, do a proof of cash, maybe talk to a QE provider, get to some point in the QE process where you feel good about the business. They give us a positive indication. Um, and then also be working with lenders, you know, have it vetted by several, you know, top SBA BDOs or brokers that will be able to tell you like, Hey, Alan, like I, you know, I think I'm going to get this through, right? Like if somebody like Bruce Marks, who's been on this pod before says like, hell, this is a good deal. I think I can get it through. You can, you can probably take that to the bank. Right. Um, uh, so at that stage, you want to get us involved, right? Because we want to be moving aggressively so that we can advance things. Last thing you want to do is get all the way through a quality of earnings process or all the way through the credit underwriting process and then say, okay, now I'm going to hire lawyers, right? Because then we're way behind the eight ball. That's when that fatigue starts to set in. So you want to kind of find that sweet spot between those two things. I hate when my clients have busted deal fees as well. So I'm always very careful to kind of examine. And if you're working with one of the good, you know, SB, S, SMB, SBA quality of earnings providers too, we'll go have conversations with those guys, you know, Kane Crossing, Guardian Due Diligence, um, you know, we'll, we'll have conversations with them to see what they're seeing first before we advise on moving forward or not moving forward. Cause I don't want to, I don't want people to be running bills and not have businesses to show for it either. So we're, we're yeah. we trying to be thoughtful. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. And what does the timeline look like in terms of, you know, once people actually engage you, I mean, not excluding the LOI sort of representation phase, you know, yeah. what does that look like timeline wise, obviously can vary a lot, but what have you sort of seen on the, the shorter side to close versus I guess the longer side where something is dragged out? You can get a deal done in 40 days. We just closed one actually on Friday slash today that um, was about a 40 day close. Um, most deals are in the 60 day range. You know, it's probably for your quality of earnings is 30 days. Negotiating from there is 30 days. Uh, getting the bank to cooperate, maybe 10 to 15 days. So you want to have some of that run concurrently and you can get done in 60 to 75 days in most deals. Some deals drag on for quality of earnings purposes and, lending problems and the like, or they've got files that are just sitting on their desk. If you go to a, you know, a bad, a bad bank. Um, but I'd say 60 to 75 days is probably about right. Yeah. That's, that's pretty fast. All things considered. Yeah, it is, especially when you think about M&A, I mean, Helen, you've done lots of things in your life, sold a, you know, big profitable business. Um, you know, my prior life at Kirkland, I was doing mid market private equity M&A. Like those deals can drag on for six, nine, 12 months. You get, government approvals involved, like it, you can negotiate for a year in a transaction. And so seeing most of these deals get through in, you know, sub 90 days is, is, is pretty smart. When we think about our cash conversion cycle as a business ourselves, we really think about it in quarters, right? If we've got a deal in process now, we, we expect that it'll probably close within that quarter. Got it. No, that's, yeah. that's really helpful. Um, curious what other sort of common mistakes you see in this process that drag, you know, drag these deals beyond the the 60 day range. Um, or yeah. just maybe generally, you know, you see so many searchers looking at businesses, maybe even pre LOI, you know, what are some common mistakes you, you see people come across? Yeah. One of the biggest ones is overestimating your ability to do certain parts of the transaction. We see really sophisticated people, you know, people with wall street backgrounds come in and go, Hey, I'm going to do a, I'm going to do the quality of earnings for this main street pool services business. You're like, Okay. That makes sense. Right. And then what you find is that it is enormously difficult. It is papers in, you know, Cheryl's got to get up in the attic to get the, pa the physical papers. 
Um, you know, and so all of a sudden you've bitten off more than you could chew in that part of the transaction. Meanwhile, you've got to hurt cats, right? You've got a bank, you've got lawyers, you've got quality of earnings provided, you got landlords, you've got the seller themselves you're trying to keep a good relationship with, you got your family, you got kids that are trying to find new schools to go to, and you're looking at schools and rental houses, and you're also trying to do this quality of earnings on paper, right? And so one thing I would suggest, and again, it's it's asking a barber if you need a haircut, but bring in high quality advisors into your deal. Like spending ten to thirty thousand dollars to do a quality of earnings when you're making a multi million dollar investment, to me is simply insurance. And the best thing that could happen, I had somebody recently go, "Man, I just really don't want to spend the money and have them find something that's wrong with the business." And I'm like, "No, that's exactly why you want to spend the yes. If there's something wrong with this business, you want to know now." And you want to back out, right? And you, you know you don't want to buy this business, so you get the point. Uh, but we see a lot of that, you know, people trying to DIY parts of the uh, of the process themselves, um, not keeping a strong relationship with the seller, right? I had a great buyer, one of my favorite buyers. He had a biz- a great business fallout in his first process, and his conclusion at the end was, "Hey, I'm in Florida, and the business is in Canada." And, you know, keeping a strong relationship with that seller throughout the process with that type of geographical distance just wasn't possible. So in business number two, I'm going to make sure it's within three hours because I'm going to be there every weekend. I'm going to be talking to that seller as much as I possibly can. Um, And he did that. He had a great relationship with the seller and he was organized and, you know, closed in a, on a, on a, a pretty great business and it's been going well um, ever since. And so, I think that's the biggest part of it, but, you know, move fast, use good advisors, um, and then just, you know, focus on what's most important, which is keeping a great relationship with the sellers. I mean, the best buyers, they'll get to the end of the process and we're negotiating a lease or something like that. And they're like, listen, Eric, like, I trust this guy. Like, I've got an amazing relationship with him. He's going to be the landlord. He's not going to screw me. Like, let's just get through it and get this thing closed. Okay. Best case scenario. That's, that's a great thing to hear towards the end of the transaction. Oftentimes too, I'll get a call, the other side of the equation, you know, two weeks before closing, they're like, Eric, should I do this? You know, should I buy this business? Um, and I'm like, I'm a lawyer, Helen. Like you're asking the, you're asking the wrong person, you know? Um, so yeah. No, that's a, uh, no, thanks for sharing that. I guess I'm curious, you know, before love to hear some of the, the favorite deal, favorite deals you've helped close, but even before that, any just general trends you're seeing in the space right now, you know, based off all the deals you've done in the past year, um, maybe even before that, or, you know, since you started to now. Yeah. Probably the biggest trend is the partial rollover, right? When we were doing deals a year and a half ago, 90 plus percent of them were asset deals, right? You want to buy assets in a small business acquisition because you don't inherit the vast majority, 90 plus percent of the historical liabilities, save for a few specific things like tax, environmental, or employee issues that could have successor liability. You're going to sever off all of the historical liability. So you want to buy assets. You also get more favorable tax treatment with assets where you take the purchase price allocated across the the, the assets and you get better depreciation, amortization, better P&L after closing. <clears throat> and that has changed pretty dramatically. Now we're seeing a lot of stock deals. And in the past, you would do stock deals in instances where you needed to do a stock deal because when you buy the entire business instead of just the machine, in an asset deal, you take the machine apart and you transfer it over to a new uh, entity and you put the machine back together, right? In a stock deal, you buy the whole business with the machine in it. And we would see in certain instances, the stock deal structure, because you would need to buy the whole business because there would be certain parts of the machine that you couldn't transfer over, right? Like important contracts. We had a um, physical therapy clinic that had really important payor contracts from big insurance companies, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, Aetna, and the like. And there was no way to get them to transfer over. So you got to buy the stock instead, right? That's something that's always been the case. But now because the SBA has changed their rules, which in the past you had to buy 100% of a target company in order to use SBA debt. Now they will allow you to buy less than 100%. But when you do that, it has to be a stock acquisition. and can't be an asset acquisition, at least thus far. We've been trying some different things, but thus far our conclusion is it has to be a stock deal. Um, and 
that creates a whole host of potential problems. In addition to the historical liability stuff that we just talked about, which is very real, right? Because when you buy a small business, Helen, like it's very foreseeable that Uncle Sam will show up with a $10 million tax bill or you'll get hit with a $10 million lawsuit or whatever. You get the point. Yeah. The problems can be really significant. With a stock deal, when that $10 million you know, tax bill shows up, it's yours and you have to figure out how to try to allocate it to the seller based on the contract. In an asset deal, you get to say, hey, Uncle Sam, thanks for the check, but it actually belongs to Helen. You know, go take it to her. Um, in addition to that, you're now partnering with the seller, right? Which a lot of people view as the benefit of the partial rollover. Like how fantastic, right? I get to keep the seller and the seller is now going to uh, have skin in the game to make sure that I'm successful and they're going to make sure that that key relationship stays in place. And they're going to, now they can be in an employment relationship for greater than a year, as opposed to a consulting relationship for sub a year. You get the point. But now you're partnering with the seller, somebody you don't really know, right? You've known them for 60, maybe 90 days, maybe a little bit more. Um, and that partnership, any partnership can be incredibly challenging. But now you're partnered with this person who, good luck coming into their business and telling them, hey, everything you've been doing isn't working. And now I'm going to change things. At least that's what they're going to hear, right? Helen thinks she knows it all. You know, 30-year-old Helen coming into my business I've been running for 20 years is going to tell me what to do, you know? And so we see a lot of post-closing issues where those relationships that they thought were going to be great are actually not great. And so you've got to build into those transactions ways to get that seller out, ways to buy back their equity, call back their equity, fire them and remove them from the property because, you you can get them doing crazy stuff and completely undermining you as a new buyer, which is a really big threat to you. You know, when you show up, you buy a small business, you have got to exude confidence, right? Your employees have to believe in you. Your suppliers have to believe in you. The community has to believe in you. Your customers have to believe in you, particularly like if you're in some sort of trades and you're, you're counting on general counsels to, you know, cut you checks and AR cycles worth 30 days for the seller, but now all of a sudden yours are 60, 75. You can't figure out why that is. They're not paying you. It may be because they don't believe you You can do run the, the business and that the business is going to go under and they're not trying to uh, go under with you. So you show up, you got to be enormously confident. If you've got the seller, they're undermining you throughout the process. It creates a lot of risk. So that's one, it can be a great thing also, but we're seeing that trend um, over and over again. Um we also, you know, a lot of stuff you see too, Hell, HVAC businesses are super hot. Um, industry type, it's kind of all over though, right? It's, yeah. So, yeah. That's, that's interesting with the partial rollovers um, that you're they're seeing a lot. It's interesting because even, you know, I'm just thinking of a specific deal we did with the large forgivable seller dough. It, it was challenging just to, um, even though the seller no longer, you know, owned the company, it was still it was still this like battle between, you know, him coming in every day and like acting like the boss still versus, you know, our CEO going in. So yeah. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. I think, one. I think stock deals are, it was maybe 10%. Now it's more like 30, 35, wow. maybe 40, but it's, it's, it's a big shift. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Well, let's move on into some of, some of the fate, your, your favorite deals that you've helped close or maybe not close. I'm curious to hear some of your war stories, I guess. Yeah, I think one of my favorite things in the business is when you see people who've had adversity in their first deal. Like I've got a bunch of buyers that had an initial deal that they got really far along with and then had that devastating bust deal. Yeah. And those people, it's it's such an example of like the human spirit and how we are sharpened by fire because they come back and they're so organized and they're so aggressive and they're so decisive and it's almost, you know, obviously you'd never root for the, you know, for a, a busted deal, but you see really great outcomes as a result of it. So that's interesting. Um, we've had clients buy really great businesses, right? And go into pitches with sellers, with businesses that they shouldn't get, right? Businesses that should be sold to private equity for like a turn more of EBITDA. And like, instead of, um, you know, instead of pitching them spreadsheets and, the like they're looking at pictures of their grandkids, you know, they're getting a three and a half million, no exaggeration, like three and a half million dollar, even a business for like 10 and a half million dollars, right? Like wow. incredible outcomes. Um, those are usually transactions where like the seller is such a big, uh, you know, my way, or the highway personality, then the deal is really tough. Um, but we see a lot of those. 
Uh, we see a lot of repeat buyers, right? When I started the firm, I remember somebody being like, you know, your biggest problem, Eric, with your business is, you know, project-based revenue. Like you'll have no re re recurring or reoccurring revenue. And I think that's largely true. We're a law firm, but we have a lot more reoccurring revenue than I ever would have anticipated. And people who are buying second businesses, people who are then selling. We've had some sellers, you know, they get 18 to 24 months in, either they sell to a roll up in the same space or they go, hey, this was fun and a good experience. And now I'm going to go do something different. And they sell basically for the same purchase price or a little bit of a gain. Um, and so those are fun to see. So sinks the full life cycle. You know, we're about, like I said, two and a half years now into the firm. So we haven't quite seen. It'll be interesting to see after 10 years, how many people come full circle in from buy side to sell side. That's so interesting that in such a short period of time, people are already coming back, buying additional businesses. Do you see that? second deal. I think the stat I read was, you know, the average searcher takes them 23 months to close their first deal. Do you think, I mean, based off your experience of the second deals a lot faster? What, I, what actually is don't, your... I don't think that's accurate for self-funded search. I think that's probably some Stanford study stuff on traditional, more traditional search where your capital back, did you, you know, are looking for a bigger business? I, I mean, the vast majority of people who come to me and it's, it's weird. You can't talk to all the searchers because there's just too many, right? Like, so we have sure. to be very careful in screening, you know, and it's hard to tell at first who's serious and who's not. So we do office hours and some different things that kind of like differentiate. But when I have people who come to me, they're like, Hey, Eric, I'm buying a business. Like oftentimes they'll be back like three, four, six months later, and like they have a business or they'll send me like multiple LOIs over the course of 12 months. And then like they buy a business. I don't think 23 months is, is accurate in the self-funded space, but we do see a lot of buyers that I say it's a mile to the starting line an inch to the second one. They'll, they'll, you know, take a little while, like I said, three, six, 12 months to, to buy that first one. And then they're back with like a second one within that same time, time frame, you know, in the same space. And we've seen many that like have done that with like three and 12 months. And then they're like, okay, wait a second. Like that third one wasn't as easy to, uh, to integrate as we thought it was going to be. So like now we're going to pump the brakes a little bit. Um, but we do see them be very aggressive. And I think once they see it working, um, they get very ambitious, very fast. Yeah. And then there's, there's setbacks. I had one that, um, had a great business and they were under LOI to buy a second one like nine months later. And then they called me and they were like, Hey, like our main distributor is like pissed off about something we did with our salespeople. And like, they're going to pull the contract. So like kill that LOI. We're not doing anything, but operating this business. Um, so it's a lot of interesting kind of watching them trial and error, yeah. um, in the holding company, uh, building process. I mean, as, as you said earlier, you know, operating the business is the toughest part. So just full circle here. Yeah. I'm curious, you mentioned, I guess there's still a couple hundred million dollars of deals that weren't SBA that you've done. How are mm -hmm. people financing those mostly? Yeah, conventional deals, um, seller financing deals, mergers. My partner, Kevin, has um, a lot of relationships in cannabis. The cannabis sector is just like completely, uh, yeah, yeah con consolidating itself and through 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 largely worthless equity. I'm in trouble for saying that, but, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of paper and consolidation, they're, they're struggling quite a bit. So there's, there's, there was some of that in there. Um, but conventional debt is, is readily available for folks that buy businesses that have North and right now it's about three and a half million in earnings and you can go get conventional debt. It's, it's not as good as SBA debt. You, you'll get it without a personal guarantee. So that's nice. Um, but, you know, then you have covenants and much lower leverage. You know, you got to inject much more equity. Um, so we see quite a bit of that. We do a lot of work for micro private equity funds, independent sponsors, true mid-market PE funds on smaller deals and the like. And so they're they're injecting equity, taking conventional debt and the like. Yeah, I guess the three and a half million in earnings would be a non-starter for a lot of self-funded folks. So. Yeah, because those businesses trade for a lot, right? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I know we're almost at time, but I guess any last minute sort of final words of wisdom, tips for especially the first time searchers out there? Yeah, well, just get after it, right? Um, you've you've got to see a lot of transactions. You know, I think it was 20, you know, at some point somebody said 27 plus, you know, whatever. For some scientific reason, you want to see at least 27 deals in the same space before you... You know, and then after that, statistically, the next one will be your best deal. I don't know if there's any truth to that, but like you definitely need reps, right? To get the confidence, talking to sellers, talking to brokers. I had a counsel this morning and he's like, 
you know, I, I want to go ask about working capital, but blah, blah, blah. I'm like, go ask about working capital because you need it, right? It's just like any other asset in the business. If they're not going to get it, then you need to adjust your purchase price if you want to be smart. Um, and if they don't like that, then you'll move on to the next one, right? Like you know, set, first time buyers have such a tendency to, to want to walk on eggshells for the seller and the broker. And yes, you should be diplomatic. And yes, it is a sales process. But you're talking about making a multi-million dollar investment in something that's going to be life-changing. And the reason these trade for such you know lucrative multiples is that they're illiquid and they're very risky. So what that means is you're stuck in something that could go to zero that is personally guaranteed by the home that your children sleep in, right? You don't need to walk on eggshells in that in a process like that. And so have a set criteria, go into it and say, here is the type of business that I want to buy because of who I am as a person and what I want to run and what I can run. Here is the deal structure that I'm willing to agree to based on economic terms, valuation, debt service coverage ratio, and then also in the legal process, the type of risk allocation that I'm willing to accept. Like I'm just not willing to accept, you know, reps that don't survive closing that are apt even with fundamental and, you know, the non-compete at, you know, a 10th of the purchase price, things, crazy things like that. I'm not willing to accept that. Go into that with a broker, build those relationships, let, let brokers and people in the community know that you're serious about transacting. You're not goofing around, but that you're going to run a smart, sophisticated process and you'll get a great outcome. If you go into it going, I desperately need to get this deal done, you know, for emotional reasons and it pops up, right? Like it's inevitable that like Helen, like you're moving from Virginia to, you know, to, to Denver and your wife or your husband is like, what's going on, Helen? What's going on? We've got to find school for the kids. And when is this going to close? And what the hell's going on? Like you've got to communicate to those people in your life and put yourself in a position up front that you're in a position of strength, you're not desperate and that you can progress um, assertively through the process and you'll get it. You'll get a good outcome if you do that. Um, so I think that's how you do it. I, I think that's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's great advice, Eric. Um, I guess, Oh, final question. If people want to reach out after you know watching this podcast, where should they find you? Yeah. So we're SMB law group, um, small, medium business law group, uh, SMB law dot group is our website. You can find me on uh, Twitter at SMB underscore attorney, uh, LinkedIn, Eric Pasifici. And uh, like Deion Sanders says, I'm not hard to find. So DM me, email me, call me. Uh, always happy to talk small business. I talk about this stuff 22 hours a day, Helen. As soon as I hang up on this I'm podcast, sure. my next conversation is going to be exactly the same as this one. So uh, anytime anybody wants to chat, I'm always happy to do that. And I really appreciate you having me on. Yeah, appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Eric.